Okay. So what do we know about scatter radiation? Is scatter radiation good or bad? Bad. Yeah. It's bad, right? It's bad for the image. It's also bad for anybody that comes into contact with scatter radiation. Why? Because it's basically a fraction of the primary beam. So it's not going to be as strong. It's not going to be as intense. So anything that interacts with scatter radiation, radiographically, you're going to get what? Fog. You're going to get fog. Right? If it interacts with either a tech or a patient, what does scatter radiation mean for them? Attenuation. It's going to be attenuation with a greater chance of, uh, uh, greater chance of increasing biological effects. So if we can limit, and what we're talking about here limiting is we're controlling the size of the x-ray beam. If we can limit the size of the x-ray beam, not only can we control the size of the primary beam, but what's also in there once it interacts with the patient. Okay, so you've got the primary beam interacting with the patient. What's left is your remnant radiation. Okay, that includes both. That includes both your primary radiation and your scatter radiation. Okay, so if I can control the size of my x-ray beam, Am I also controlling the size of the scatter radiation that's being produced? Okay, when you're looking at it, the bigger picture. All right, so what we're going to do here, first of all, again, review scatter radiation. It's a change in direction of the x-ray photon after interaction with the atoms from the patient. So how does scatter radiation affect the image? Well, what we know is that it is going to increase density. Okay, this increased density is also known as fog. So picture as you, if you will, that if the image starts to get darker, what is going to happen to your overall contrast? It's going to go from black and white into what? Something that's going to look a little bit more gray. Okay? And if it's too dark, if it's too gray, then what happens to the overall quality of your image? Are you going to also lose some detail and resolution? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes. Okay? All right. So we talked about the primary radiation. You have your electrons traveling from cathode to anode. X-rays are produced of various energies. Okay. Then that primary radiation is going to interact with some kind of object. And when it interacts with that object, there's, there's no doubt scatter radiation is also going to result from that. Because it's going to interact with the object. It's just going to deflect in all different directions with lower energies. So once the primary radiation interacts with the patient, it is a combination of both primary radiation and what? Remnant radiation. Scatter radiation or secondary radiation. Okay, that is the result. Okay, the remnant radiation is gonna carry the aerial image prior to the image being processed. So factors that influence the degree of scatter radiation, I talked about this earlier, is if I can limit or control the size of my x-ray beam, if I can make it smaller, not only am I controlling the size of my primary radiation, but I'm also controlling the amount of scatter radiation. Okay? With that said, the bigger the field size, more scatter radiation is going to be a result. Okay? So the bigger the field size, we're talking about my x-ray beam, the bigger the field size, the greater the result of scattered radiation. Number two, we talked about the thickness of the object, right? The greater, the, the, the thicker the object, the more chance of scattered radiation is going to be produced. Okay? But we can't just limit it to thickness because we also got it to take in consideration the composition of the object being x-rays. So you can have one inch of muscle versus one inch of bone, okay? Which do you think is gonna cause more scatter radiation, the muscle or the bone? The bone. The bone, okay? So the more dense the object, the greater chance of scatter radiation. So even, even like uh, parts of your body that's like air and it's very radiolucent, that'll still cause scatter radiation? Very little, but yes. Okay. Okay, scatter radiation will be produced no matter what because it has to interact with something. Got you. Okay? 
We talked about KV, higher KVs. You're also going to be producing higher energy scatter radiation, which then will interact with both patient as well as your radiographic film. So higher KVs, that's where we've got to find our happy medium, remember? We want penetration, we want attenuation, but we don't want too much penetration and too much attenuation. We want something that's in between. Okay, and then we talked about the density of the object. Okay, so factors that affect the amount of scattered radiation reaching the image receptor. Anything that increases your beam size, the thickness of the object, your KV, this is your tube potential, and then the density or the composition of the material being x-rayed is also going to influence scatter radiation. Okay, any questions so far? So what we're going to do here is introduce to you ways in which we can control the size of the x-ray beam. We're going to go from the very basic to the very complex. Okay, but the whole purpose, the number one reason, okay, it's always patient first, the number one reason for beam limiting, okay, controlling the size of the x-ray beam is to limit the amount of exposure to our patients. Okay. Number two is increase the image quality by decreasing scatter to the film. Remember, scatter increases density, decreases contrast, and takes away the detail. So if we can remove some of that scatter radiation, we are going to improve the image quality by increasing contrast and increasing overall detail of our image. Okay. Now, Keep in mind this concept, okay? Like I said, when the primary radiation interacts with an object, scatter radiation is gonna be produced, plain and simple. So 50 to 90% of the density on your radiograph is going to be a result of scatter radiation, okay? 59% of that density of the radiograph is gonna be a result of scatter radiation. Also keep this in mind. Penumbra. First of all, what's penumbra? Blur. Blur. Blur is going to be greater at the edges of the beam. So we're talking about our x-ray beam. Off the sides of that x-ray beam on the edges is what's going to cause penumbra or blur on your image. Okay? Keep that in mind for just a moment. This is going to make sense here in just a little bit. All right, so we got two images here. Okay, it's an x-ray of the same skull phantom. One, we have an open beam, so our beam is wide and large, whereas the second one, we are physically limiting or controlling the size of our x-ray beam to a smaller field. When you look at the two images, let's just focus on this area right here. Okay, same area as this, let's focus on the same area here. Which of the two images is going to be more gray, A or B? A is going to be more gray, right? When you look at this, this is very black and white. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Versus this, there's a little bit more gray tones to it. This is due to scatter radiation, okay? Because remember, larger field size, increase scatter radiation, increase fog, okay? What happens to contrast? Contrast can decrease. <coughs> so this is why you have more black and white over here, more gray here. And because it's darker and more gray, what's going to happen to your overall detail of your image? It's Is it going to go up or down? Down. It's going to go down. So again, let's compare the detail between the two images. Wide field versus collimation. You can see the outline of the frontal sinuses here divided into two halves. You guys see that? Mm -hmm. Can you see that in this image here? A bit. Barely. But very faint, right? Yeah. Okay, we are losing some detail due to scatter radiation. Okay, <clears throat> let's look at the orbital ridges. Nice and crisp, kind of blurry on the edges here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the bony nasal septum coming down your nasal cavity, you can see the lines of the nasal septum. You cannot see the definition of the nasal septum here. 
Are you guys following where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. And then one last thing I want to show you here is you can actually see the bony markings. See that black structure coming squiggly lines coming down this way and this way? Mm -hmm. so can you see it on this image here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're also losing the very fine details of the skull anatomy. All right. So again, larger field size, more scatter, more fog, decrease in contrast, decrease in detail. Okay. Let's look at an impatient aspect. Who's getting more exposure? The one on the right, A, or the one on the left, B? A. A. Okay. So again, wider field, all bad, 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 bad. But also when we're looking at patient exposure, because the beam is larger, more parts of the patient is being exposed, right? And if we can limit the size, now we're protecting all this area right here. So they're not getting unnecessary exposure down here in your jawline. In the area of maybe where your thyroid is located down here, around your neck, right underneath your jaw, which is very radiosensitive. Okay, does everybody follow this concept so far? Is collimation used with just uh, film or is it used with computer? You also use it, you also want to use it for computerized radiography. Because although the computerized radiography may clean up the image, they're still getting struck by the Scattered. primary beam. We want to limit the size of the beam to only the area of interest. Okay, so let's talk about the different types of beam limiting devices. Again, we're controlling the size of the x-ray beam. We're going to go from the most simple to the most complex. So we're going to go with the aperture diaphragm, the cones, and then the variable aperture. Each of these beam limiting devices is going to be composed of lead. Okay, why lead? Because of its property to what? To absorb radiation. To absorb or attenuate radiation. Okay, so the beam limiting devices is going to be composed of lead. The very basic type we're going to be talking about here is an aperture diaphragm. What is an aperture? Okay. An aperture is just basically a window or an opening. Right. It's just a window or an opening. Okay. So these are leaded plates with holes okay, cut out in the middle of different shapes, depending on what anatomical structure or object you want to x-ray. Okay. So again, they're leaded plates with an opening down the middle, and they go down a slot right where your x-ray tube is, your collimator box, and now we can limit the size of the x-ray beam. The problem with this is that you have to change the size for each type of field size that you want. Okay, so if I wanted a different size of an x-ray beam, I had to switch out the leaded plates. Okay, they are the simplest, least expensive. However, again, downsize is you gotta change it for each size. Also with the aperture diaphragm, there is still going to remain a large amount of blur on the edges of the beam. So although it is controlling the size of the x-ray beam, it isn't cleaning out the edges of that beam, which produces penumbra or blur on your radiographic image. <clears throat> These are uh, constructed for dedicated units. Okay, they're only made for special units. So lead plates with windows cut out. They come in various shapes and sizes. I have a couple here. Okay. Circular square. This is made for the, the head and the neck. Okay. They're both the same, both leaded for attenuation, okay? Second one here is the cones. We've got two different kinds. We've got the flared cone and then we've got the cylindrical cone, the cylinder. So you've got the flare and the cylinder cone. Here's an example of a flared cone. Same thing as your aperture diaphragms. At the end of this cone, there will be a plate on, on that with a cone extending from it. 
and just slide it on the slot of the extra <coughs> tube. The problem with the flared cone, well, first of all, it does match the diver divergence of the beam, okay? So here is the flared cone. Here is your beam being produced up at the x-ray tube, okay? So it matches the divergence of the beam. But because it matches the divergence of the beam, it also isn't effective in cleaning out the number on the edges, okay? We can still control the size of the beam, but it doesn't truly clean out the edges of the beam. Okay. Here is an example of a cylinder cone, just like in the previous image that I showed you. Blur is reduced because it truly limits the size of the x-ray beam, and the beam is circular. So here, as the beam is being diverged, it is cleaning out the edges. Okay? And it does an excellent job in cleaning out the edges, eliminating some of the blur. Now, this cylinder cone that I have here, it comes with an extension. Okay, it comes with an extension. So if you can imagine that if I were using a cylinder cone with an extension, do you think that it's going to clean out the edges of the, of the beam even better. Just now imagine, if you will, if I extend the cone, and the cone extends all the way down here, am I not also cleaning out these edges of the beam as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, so even with a cone with extension, it even does a better job. They're all traveling in a straight line until it interacts with the patient. Once it interacts with the patient or the object, it now becomes scatter radiation. So coming, so coming from yes, yeah, so coming from the X-ray tube, they're all coming down in a straight line. But just like a light, it travels in divergence. Even with the cylinder. Even with the cylinder. So all these on the side, they're now going to get cut off by the edges of the cylinder, and those in the middle traveling in a much more straighter line will reach the patient and then interact with the image receptor. So again, just imagine, just it, it doesn't matter, okay. it doesn't matter, because here, here is your anode, can you see? Okay, you have your electrons. The beam that's gonna be produced is gonna be a divergent beam, but all these on the edges, they're still traveling in a straight line. Everything is a straight line. Everything is straight, okay? So when it interacts with the cone, all these will be cleaned off, okay? But these, unless it's very, very straight, those are the ones that's gonna go through the cone. But they're still traveling in a straight line. Until it interacts with the patient down here, and now they're going in all different directions. That's your scatter radiation. If I didn't make any sense, it's in the end of the class. <laughs> All right. So, the disadvantage of a cylinder cone, though, is that you have excessive radiation for larger body parts. Okay? Our image receptor is square or rectangular. However, our cone is circular. So if I wanted to utilize this part of the film here, so here is my cone beam, but I want to use this part of the film too for our larger body part. How am I going to get this part included in my beam? I'd have to use a larger cone, okay? I'd have to use a larger cone such as this, all right? So I have my square or rectangular image receptor, but now I have a larger beam. You see the problem with that is my patient now is getting additional exposure unnecessarily. And I can only use this part of the film, so wherever the circular beam is, my patient is getting struck with radiation here, but it's not going to get imaged because it's not part of the <coughs> square image receptor. Okay? So the problem again with a, cyl a cylinder cone, 
and I'm repeating this because you know me by now, right, if I'm repeating it. The problem with a cylinder cone is that you have a square or rectangular image receptor in a circular beam. You're going to get more radiation exposure with excessive sizes, with larger body parts. So excessive exposure for larger body parts. All right, so this is the comparison in detail when utilizing the different types of um, average diaphragms and then your cylinder and flared cone. So here we're not using a limiter, okay? So the beam size is not being controlled, which means that you're gonna have excessive blurring on the edges of the image, okay? With a flared cone, it matches the divergence of the beam. However, it's still not completely cleaning out the edges, but it is better in comparison with without one, right? Okay, minimal amounts versus a large amount here. Minimal, large amount. And if we use a <laughs> cylinder cone, it is truly limiting the size of the beam, therefore blurring is minimized. And if you use an extender, more blur is cleaned out. Okay. Now, last thing we're going to talk about here is a variable aperture. First of all, what did we say an aperture was? Opening. opening. It's an opening or a window. With the aperture diaphragm, we had to change the lead plates for different sizes of our X-ray beam. With a variable aperture, we can do this manually by a twist of a knob without having to switch out plates. It's a variable aperture. Okay. We can control it the various sizes of the beam. It is also known as a collimator. It is also known as a beam limiting device, an automatic collimator, and a positive beam limiting device. Okay. In simple terms, we just call it a collimator. However, if there's a question very specific to the names of them, you have to understand what they're doing. Both automatic and positive beam limiting devices do the same thing, which means that once I place my image receptor in the film tray, the film tray is going to sense the size of my image receptor and open up my beam to the size of my image receptor. It's automatic. Okay? It will also sense the orientation of my cassette. Because I can put in my cassette in the film tray either lengthwise or I can place it in crosswise. It will limit the size to the orientation of your cassette as well. So not only the size, but the orientation of your image receptor. Okay, portrait or landscape. It will sense it. And it will open it up to that size of the beam. Now, they do the same thing, but the difference with uh, the difference with the positive beam limiter is that it will not allow me to go um, larger than the size of my image receptor. It has a safety mechanism in there that if I wanted to just adjust it and make it a little <coughs> bit bigger, I mean, I don't understand why you would because the image receptor is limited in size. So why would you want to go bigger? Okay, But this prevents you from doing that. And if you try to twist the knob, turn a key, whatever, manipulate the size of the beam, it won't allow you to do it. This is what this feature does. Again, both the same thing, except this has a safety feature. Okay. Now, let's just say, for instance, I'm using a 14 by 17 image receptor, but I wanted to take an x-ray of my hand. Can I limit the size of my x-ray beam to just the size of my hand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. It allows you, again, for different field sizes. You just have to turn off the beam. Yes, you just gotta, you can manually manipulate the size of the beam. So once it automatically goes up to 14 by 17, I just turn my knobs down to the size in the area of my hand. Okay. 
Now the mechanism for the uh, automatic collimator in the PBL looks something like this, okay? It's within the collimator box. You've got two sets of lead, I don't know what you want to call them, uh, lead slats, okay? Which controls the length and the width of your field, but there's two of them. Okay, I'm gonna explain what the two shutters mean. The lead shutters, that's what I was trying to say. What the two lead shutters do. Also within the collimator box, you are going to have a light and a mirror. The light, because x-rays is invisible, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. We need something to represent the x-ray beam. So I know the size of my field. So all I have to do is just push a button, the light switch comes on, the light's gonna be reflected off the mirror and onto the patient. We're all good. Okay, we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> So now the light's gonna be reflected onto the mirror and the beam, the, the represent, representation of the X-ray beam is gonna be the light field. And now I can actually see my field size, physically, okay, with the use of light mirrors. Okay, so then your automatic collimator, your PBL, there's going to be two sets of horizontal lead shutters. They are adjustable, allows for infinite number of field sizes. You are going to have a light bulb and some mirrors to represent the x-ray field, okay? And it has to the inherent filtration. Remember our filtration? We were talking about filtration in the past. What does filtration do? Hardens the beam. Hardens the beam by removing what? Soft rays. The softer rays, okay? Making it more harder, more uniform. Okay, now we've got two sets of shutters. The first one, the upper shutter, is gonna control the off-focus radiation. I'm gonna talk about that here in just a little bit. The lower shutters, this is what we're familiar with, the lower set of shutters is going to control blur. So it's gonna remove the blur from the edges of the x-ray beam. Let's talk about the upper shutters and controlling off-focus radiation. Off-focus radiation is also known as stem radiation or extrafocal radiation. As the electrons are traveling from cathode to anode, they may stay within a tight pack but you are gonna have some rogue electrons, some stray electrons. Those electrons striking other parts of the anode and other parts of the x-ray equipment, you're still gonna get x-rays, okay? Because that's how x-rays are produced is through the interaction of electrons through a very hard object. So if the electrons strike other parts of that x-ray tube, <coughs> Radiation is still going to be produced, but now this is known as off-focus or stem radiation. All right? So the off-focus or stem radiation will still make its way down with the primary beam, interact with the patient, interact with our image receptor. Okay? And now you get something like this. I've limited the size of my x-ray beam, but electrons that were converted into x-rays from uh, striking other parts of the x-ray tube. Off focus. What's another name for focus? Your target, remember that? So it's off the target. Off target or off focus radiation is still gonna interact with the film. So even if I collimated and limited the size of my x-ray beam, it is still causing x-rays to strike anatomical structures that you did not include within your beam size, okay? So the purpose of the upper shutters is to control this. Your off focus, off target, off focal, stem radiation. Those are all the names for it, okay? Any questions, everybody got it? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, here's your shutters controls length and width, okay? This is underneath the collimator box. You can see the light being reflected through the collimator box to represent the x-ray beam. 
you have a panel, a radiolucent panel, that has the crosshairs. Okay? So that way, when you hit the light, the beam is going to be reflected, the light beam is going to be reflected on your patient. You know exactly what you're x-raying. And in the middle of the crosshair is where I'm going to find what? The central ray. The central ray. And it's a central ray that's going to have 100 intensity of the original beam. And that jaw in the middle of your anatomy here? Right in the anatomy. We put the central ray right at the thickest part of the anatomy, where we know it's 100% intense. Okay. And then we, you know, again, after you put your film in, it automatically columnates to the size of the film. And then we can adjust it if we have a smaller body part. So we can adjust it to the area of interest without giving the patient additional radiation exposure. Okay. I know you need a nap. <laughs> We're going to do some math.